I'm High Hill Knight. Welcome to my channel. This is my review of Star Wars Episode 8, The Last Jedi. With admitted bias, I give the movie a firm A. Episode 8 takes place almost immediately after the events of Episode 7. Rey has gone off to the secret Jedi Island to find Luke Skywalker to hopefully learn more about the Force, learn more about herself, and recruit Skywalker back into the Galactic Conflict, where the Resistance is doing its best to escape the First Order. They're in a very dire situation, and everything they attempt to do seems to lead to more and more failure, and it seems like the Resistance is about to collapse just as it was finally making some headway in defeating the First Order. There is a ton to unpack with this movie. Uh, there's no way I can cover all of it. So just to keep things relatively contained, I'm going to focus on specific aspects. First, I'm going to mention two specific things that I absolutely didn't like about the movie, two things that I loved about the movie, two things that I'm kind of in the mix about. Then I'm going to explain why I'm biased, which is also in two parts. First, I'll explain why I'm uh, biased uh, in a happily loving fanboy way. And I'm also going to explain why, on all honesty, if this were any other film, I would rip it to shreds. I would hate it from almost start to finish. And then after all of that, I'll give my uh, verdict. And if you want to jump to any particular parts, there will be timestamps in the description. So with that being said, let's get on with the review. So the first big thing that I absolutely hate about the movie was that Kylo Ren destroyed his helmet and apparently the plan was for him to no longer have the, Va the Vader-esque helmet anymore. Now, I never liked the voice modulation of the helmet, but I love the helmet itself. I love the look. It completed uh, the fanboyish of him worshiping his grandfather. And once he takes that mask off, I mean, Adam Driver is a nice looking guy, but still, it's hard to have that menacing presence without the helmet. Now, maybe they'll bring back the helmet in the next movie. Maybe we'll have some type of Supreme Commander helmet. But, yeah, it, I, there's so much was lost without having having that nice, iconic helmet on throughout the majority of the movie. I was really disappointed, really taken out, watching this guy with this nice hair and just his cute little uh, scar trying to be intimidating. It just doesn't work as well. And by the way, where are the nicer men? What, what, what happened to them? They're, they were, I think, mentioned once in a sentence, but we still haven't really seen them in action. So, yeah. Uh, next movie, Helmet, Please, and Seriously, where are those nicer men? The next problem I have with this movie was over-escalation. Over-escalation in story events, and over escalation in the First Order itself. The theme of the movie is failure. Like every, almost everything the uh, heroes try, the First Order seems to just recover and pursue them more and pursue them more and pursue them more. But still, there needs to be some, uh, you know, bre brevity, some type of, okay, we did it, and, you know, rising and falling, where here is just falling and falling and falling, along with problems and problems and problems. First, they got to uh, destroy the Dreadnought. Then they got to go to light speed. Well, they can't go to hyper speed, so they uh, got to make this crazy plan to go to a casino plan to find a Pacific code breaker. Well, they, they get arrested, so they can't get that code breaker. Here's the other code breaker. They got to get out of jail. They got to uh, escape the casino. They got to get onto the first order ship. Oh, and they get captured again. They got to fight Phasma. Oh, now the uh, escape pods are being destroyed. And But they get to the planet, and now the planet is about to be uh, taken down by this battery ram. So they try to take out the battery ram, but they can't take out the battery ram. So now they got to figure out a way out of this place, even though there seems to be no exit. Problem, problem, problem. And then there's the First Order itself. Uh, the opening crawl says the First Order reigned. It's like, how? We destroyed their super giant planet base. Now, sure, it's a base, and yeah, they probably have other assets throughout the galaxy, but still, you, you'd imagine a huge chunk of their personnel and equipment would be in that base. You know, destroying such a structure like that, 
shifts in chaos to a group that's supposed to be essentially the Taliban of the galaxy. And yet, you're saying that the, the First Order reigns in, what, the day and a half at best between the two movies? And then there's the equipment itself. You know, they have Star Destroyers, and then we're introduced to a Dreadnought, which is even bigger, and they have a Dreadnought, which means there's more than one Dreadnought. And then the Supremacy, the, uh, you know, Spring Commander Snoke ship, Every time it will come on screen, I would just laugh because it is so huge. It's like the, 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 it's like the size of Australia or something. There's just no reason for that ship to be so huge. It also doesn't make any sense that the uh, rest of the galaxy wouldn't come to help. Okay? Uh, General Leia sends out the signal and says, Hey, we got the First Order here. Now, we, got the, we crippled a bunch of Star Destroyers. We crippled the Supremacy. We got... Kylo Ren, General Hux, and they don't know at the time Supreme Commander Snoke was there, but still the supremacy, the supremacy is there, so that means that uh, Supreme Commander should be there. They don't know he's there yet, but still, they're all there. Hey, come help. And the galaxy's like, oh no, we're too scared. All hope is gone. Like, hope? What, what, what about duty? Okay? If the First Order is the remnants of the Empire, shouldn't the remnants of the New Republic rally and go after them and, and if not for duty then how about good old revenge okay this flat out revenge you know they, they destroyed a bunch of planets the the, the allied planets aren't going to get revenge people that had family or friends or property there aren't going to go out and get revenge i mean that, that doesn't make any sense at all so yeah over escalation trying to make the first order bigger pretty much overnight in one movie, people complain about the powers of uh, Ray. They, they need to complain about the power levels of the First Order. It's just absurd in this movie. So let's get on to the good stuff about this movie. Yoda. Yoda comes back for a cameo, and I absolutely loved it. I was smiling from the moment he was on screen. Uh, now, some people uh, don't think that he should have been the uh, gleeful, silly... <laughs> <laughs> kind of Yoda. Some folks thought he should be the more serious uh, type of person because that uh, uh, silliness was just a distraction in the fifth film. I'm fine either way, okay? It was Yoda. He's giving wisdom. He's showing power. And people are like, well, why? Uh, why does he, if he could affect, you know, the real world, why doesn't he uh, help out? Hey, I was asking that in the previous movie. I was thinking, why does Kylo Ren love Darth Vader, can't the ghost of uh, Anakin Skywalker come talk to him, you know, and affect things? Hey, yet another pop problem with this movie, but still, just seeing Yoda, that moment between Yoda and Luke was wonderful. You know, we're not going to get a moment between Luke, Leia, and Han, but still, a moment between uh, Luke and Yoda really thrilled me. And I'm happy that it was a puppet mixed with a bunch of, bunch of uh, CGI for, you know, enhancement still. Frank Oz comes back as Yoda. Big smile on my face. That almost saved the movie for me, quite frankly. And another thing I love was the climax. And I do mean the climax itself. Uh, the only thing I would change about the climax would be just to have Luke having the green lightsaber. But yeah, I love the climax. I love that fight. I love that uh, Luke says in the movie, I'm not going to leave this island. And by the end of the film, you see, nope, he really did not leave that island. That's one of the few subversions of this film that works. This movie tries to do a lot of subversions, a lot of, oh, you didn't see that coming. But still, most of them don't work. This one works. In fact, if there had been a lot less subversions in the movie, the climax would have had a lot more impact. When Luke is standing in front of the First Order, and all those Imperial walkers are there, and he's just like, you know, just defiant. I was hoping it was going to be like the video game, uh, Star Wars The Force Unleashed. Uh, in that game, you bring down a Star Destroyer with the Force. So I was kind of hoping Luke was going to do that. He was going to just like, like raise his hand and all sorts, but he just crush all the uh, Imperial walkers. But still, uh, I was thrilled by the climax. I was thrilled that he really didn't leave the highland. I was thrilled that... Uh, was a change that I didn't see coming. I was thrilled that that subversion definitely worked. And like I said, other than just making sure the uh, light saber color was green, uh, that I feel that that climax itself was perfect. 
So as far as those things, I'm just kind of in the middle about, <laughs> I got to talk about Leia in space. Now, a lot of people have issues just for Leia displaying that level of force ability. See, clearly she never had any formal training. Well, you know, it's implied that Leia is as potentially powerful as Luke. And, you know, she, and think about it. She was already uh, a confident warrior in the original trilogy. So imagine being a, uh, a excellent warrior, a politician, and learning you have force abilities. Are you going to necessarily run off to some uh, Jedi temple to try to learn them? No. But if you're trying to rebuild a government from the ground up and you ha learn you have magic, I'm quite sure you're going to pick up a few tricks and methods here and there. Uh, so it was great to see uh, General Leia just really show off uh, a force ability, especially now that Carrie Fisher has passed away. But with that being said, it was still Leia in the void of space. And I'm sorry, that just doesn't work, okay? Yes, this is a galaxy with all types of aliens and all types of technology and space magic, but still there are certain rules one of them being that human beings can't survive in the vacuum of space, okay? It's already hard enough to swallow the idea that Star-Lord over in the Guardians of the Galaxy, he can protect his whole body with that little retractable helmet of his. Okay, that's hard enough to believe as it is, but at least it's something, okay? I don't care how powerful in the force she is, she cannot survive in the vacuum of space. And also the way it was shot was bad. A lot of people are thinking, well, once she put her hand on the um, on the door and they let her in, everyone else should have been sucked out. Uh, you have to really look close for it, but she does close the airlock before that other door opens. You don't really see it. It's just at the corner of the screen where you see a door open. She comes in and the other door closes behind her while she's holding her hand but it's shot so poorly, it's the best. So yeah, I'm very happy to see uh, Leia display a really unique uh, force moment, but that that was wrong, <laughs> wrong way to go. The next thing I'm in the middle about is Rey being a nobody. Now, I like that she's a nobody. I like that they're trying to set up that, hey, anyone can uh, become the great hero of the galaxy going forward. We don't have to try to link every hero in the future to some uh, hero or villain or uh, person or mythos in the past. That's fine. I even like that her parents were nobodies that just sold her off. I mean, think about this is a universe that has uh, all types of droids, yet still has slave labor. Uh, I, I don't really understand that, but still... I like that she's a nobody, but the way it was done was terrible. Ryan Johnson trying to subvert expectations again. You spend a movie setting up that this character has some type of mysterious history or background. You spend the next, or you spend two years waiting for those answers, and then you spend the first half of your longest uh, Star Wars film ever you know, setting up the, yeah, there's some type of mystery. We put her in some weird, creepy uh, uh, a tunnel, you know, displaying herself in, 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 in multiples and the, the snap thing and stuff. And, and, and we get nothing. And not only do we not get anything solid, but the villain says it. You know, Kyler is like, say it. Say it. And she doesn't say it. So we find so like, you know, they're you know, junkers, you know, dead, you know, uh, some, some drunks that are dead on buried in Daku. No, it should be Ray that says it. If you really want it to be that she is no one, her parents are no one, she's come up from nothing, then she should be the one saying, they're dead. I've been lying to myself. They're dead. Premier Snoke has been manipulating both of them, not just Kylo Ren, but also Ray, manipulating both of them. So, you know, even if, you know, maybe 
Kylo Ren might be mistaken. You know, he from his perspective, he's actually telling the truth. From what he knows, they are no, the parents are nobodies. But still, if you want her to be nobody, then you should have her at the very, very minimum have her saying they're dead or they're no or they just didn't care about me. They, she should be the one confirming these uh, information, not the villain. And it, you, you definitely shouldn't have it just a line. Oh, there's some some. Drunk drunkards dead. So draw for drinking money. That's it. You spend a year of build up, and then two years of waiting, and then half of a move for two thirds. About time two thirds of a move for uh, two or three sentences like that, and Richard Burton says accept that. I'm sorry. If you're building up to something, you need to pay it off. Okay. It's like there's a uh, build up. And pay off. Even if you're, you know, no one thing would have been satisfactory to all fans, but offering no thing, nothing, doesn't satisfy anyone. You wasted our time. You wasted our time. So, as you can tell, I do have some things that I like about the movie and don't like and really have a lot of issues of. So why am I giving it an A grade? Well, listen, I'm older than I look. You know, when people say they grew up with Star Wars, they probably mean they watched the original film several times, or maybe uh, they saw the prequels, that was, that was their first experience. You know, maybe they watched a couple episodes of, of the cartoons, maybe they bought a few toys. I grew up with Star Wars. I saw the Ewok movies when they aired on television. I have played a Star Wars game on a home console pretty much since the Atari age. Okay, I have seen the Clone War cartoon in the first format. I've seen the Clone War cartoon in its latter format. I don't really like Rebels, but I've watched a bunch of those episodes. I bought comics. I haven't seen the holiday special. I, I, I somehow missed that. But I have really grown up with Star Wars. I've even worked at Walt Disney World, which has the Star Wars celebration. You haven't lived until you've seen Darth Vader doing the Macarena. I have absorbed so much Star Wars content throughout my life that I am sort of accustomed to just going, Oh, okay, fine. There's a giant slug gangster that has a harem of women, despite none of them being his actual species. Okay, fine. The timeline of events in Empire are filmed like they take place over like a day or two, but actually they take place over a few weeks. Okay, fine. One version of the Clone Wars uh, says that Anakin Skywalker has a prentice. There's a Star Wars video game that says Darth Vader had a secret of Princess. Okay, fine. <laughs> There's a lot of, okay, fine, with, uh, with me growing up with Star Wars. So as I'm watching uh, The Last Jedi, th there's a piece of me in the back of my mind saying, you know, something doesn't seem right, something doesn't seem right. But I'm just enjoying the experience so much. I've spent decades going, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, when I, and so... When I first watched it, I was just saying, okay, great. That was wonderful. Kind of weird, kind of, you know, issues, but okay, fine. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work with it. I'll probably work with it. On the other hand, I usually do my reviews first. That way I can offer my totally unbiased opinion, but because it took so long for me to get this review up, I wound up watching other reviews and videos. And from watching those videos, I learned uh, the problems of this film and that was what was going in the back of my mind. Somewhere in the back of my mind was thinking, you know, there are a lot of problems with this movie, uh, not just as a franchise film, but just as a film. And, and my biggest pet peeve of franchise films and sequels is when they do something in one movie that totally ignores or totally collapses what happens in the previous movie. There are so many franchises that have done that, okay? Uh, Terminator, Transformers, Fast and Furious, Saw, Resident Evil, possibly the Cloverfield. The Cloverfield movies are starting to head in that direction. Even James Bond movies wound up doing that. 
you know, the, the, they, they make so many films and they paint themselves into a corner and then someone comes along and tries to tie everything together and, and it just collapses and, and makes problems. Or like I said, things are just totally ignored. And that happens a lot in this movie. Now, a lot of the people who try to uh, protect this movie say, well, you're winning with too many expectations. You should have had too many expectations. No, this is the eighth movie of a series. It is perfectly valid to have certain reasonable expectations. For instance, if the previous movie sets up that a character doesn't know how to pilot, then in the follow-up film, that character should still not know how to pilot. If the previous movie sets up that a character left a map so he could be found one day, then it's a reasonable expectation that he didn't just go to that secret place of seclusion to wait and die. If you set up in your own movie, a teacher is going to teach three lessons, then it's a reasonable expectation that within the film, three lessons will be taught. Now, if you set up a character that is supposed to be a famous, well-respected leader in combat, then it's a reasonable expectation that that leader would know better to withhold important information from their crew just for the heck of it? What? If all seven previous movies has the line, I have a bad feeling about this, then it's a reasonable expectation that the eighth movie will have the line, I have a bad feeling about this even if you want to mix it up, okay? Arnold Schwarzenegger, he doesn't say, I'll be back on all the movies. Sometimes he'll say, I'm back. Uh, in The Expendables, he started to say, I'll be back. And then Bruce Willis says, no, no, no. You always say that, I'm going, I'll be back. You know, you can, you can mix it up, but definitely have that, I have a bad feeling about this <laughs> moment. It's in all the other films. It's a reasonable expectation. It should be in that movie. There are plenty of reasonable expectations that comes with a series of films. There's a reasonable expectation that comes with watching something progress over decades of time. There's a reasonable expectation that if you set up that people with the force need training, whether they have a low midichlorian count, a high midichlorian count, or even the chosen one, the immaculately concepted chosen one still needs years of training to become a powerful wielder of the force. That is a reasonable expectation that some other character who is clearly talented and skilled would have had some type of training. So yeah, if this were any other film movie, I would be ripping it apart. And quite frankly, this is the tipping point for me. The one good thing I can say about this movie that it has woken me from my, I guess, indoctrination. So I can't just say, all right, that's fine anymore. Especially if Disney really plans on making movie after movie after movie after movie after movie with this franchise, okay? I, my, no, I, I, I'm not one of those people who's gonna say, oh, the Star Wars is dead. Oh, they killed Star Wars or they killed a franchise. No. But this is the tipping point. This is the point where we say, no, we love Star Wars, but you can't just toss anything out there, slap the Star Wars brand on it, and expect to get all our money. So yes, I am biased, but this is the tipping point, okay? This is the tipping point. The real problem with Star Wars The Last Jedi is that it's not the eighth episode of a series is the eighth movie of a brand. See, Disney, Lucasfilm, and the writer, directors, and the executives, they just greenlit the movies. They didn't really have a plan for them. Just make them. You know that game where one person starts a story, and then another person adds a piece to it, and then another person adds a piece, and another person adds a piece, and it's going pretty well, and then suddenly someone just throws in a giant monkey wrench into the narrative, and now the next person has to follow up and use that uh, craziness from the previous person. That's what this movie is. Now, I will say that I believe Ryan Johnson seriously thought he was going to make something unique, and I'll also admit that when you're in the creative process, sometimes you put something out there that you hope is gonna be unique and special and falls totally flat on his face, 
or sometimes he just crank out something to make a buck and it becomes a phenomenon. I believe that he genuinely thought he was doing something really excellent and just fell flat on his face and in doing so made a whole lot of other people fall flat on their face. And quite frankly, I appreciate when someone puts forth honest effort, puts forth some real attempt at creativity and just fails as opposed to just cranking something out for the sake crank of cranking something out. So that really is what saves this overall for me. And that's why uh, I'm okay with my grade of A, even though if this was any other film from any other brand, I would be ripping it apart. So I hope with the next movie, now that we'll be back with J.J. Abrams, he'll figure out some way to wrap things up with the craziness from Ryan Johnson and hopefully not retcon too many things. And going forward with the following episodes, I hope they will be episodes as opposed to uh, next films with the brand name. So with all the things that I loved, with all the things I hated, with all the things I mixed about, with my indoctrination and with my awakening, my own personal awakening, I give Star Wars The Last Jedi a solid grade of A. Okay, thank you very, very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. I welcome comments, so feel free to express yourselves in the comment section. Please like, share, and subscribe, or dislike, share, and subscribe. Thank you again for watching, and remember, find inspiration everywhere. Oh, and before I go, uh, if someone's watching this is a director in the future or writer in the future and you're working with the actor who has done a role for decades and that actor or actress tells you I fundamentally disagree with virtually everything you've done with this character that I portrayed for decades listen to the person okay <laughs> that person is trying to give you a solid warning listen to the person you might save yourself some trouble